There are about 5,000 species of mushroom in Japan. Packed with vitamins and minerals, yet low in calories, mushrooms are healthy foods and a fixture of the Japanese diet. Aromatic matsutake can be steamed in a clay teapot. Whether it's tempera fried hen of the woods or a broth of shimeji, mushrooms are a quintessential autumn food. There are some very rare mushrooms like this, the caterpillar fungus which grows on insects. Since ancient times it has been used medicinally. These glowing mushrooms on the island of Hachijojima have become a well-known tourist attraction. In recent years, Japan has seen a decline in the number of wild mushrooms. Intense efforts have been made to revive matsutake harvests. Some efforts to stimulate mushroom growth are even using artificial lightning strikes. Quite a shocking idea. On this edition of Begin Japanology, our theme is mushrooms. We'll see how Japan's climate and culture have made it the nation that eats a wider variety of fungi than any other. Hello and welcome to Begin Japanology. I'm Peter Barakan. Today I'm in Ueda, which is a city in Nagano Prefecture in central Japan, an area that's well known throughout the country for its mushrooms. As you may know, mushrooms are not plants, but fungi, a kind of mold. About 70% of Japan is covered in forest, and because the country has a moist climate, it's an ideal place to grow mushrooms. There are about 20,000 known species of mushrooms around the world, and around a quarter of those can be found in Japan. So, what kind of mushrooms will you find in Japan? Let's take a look. About 70 species of mushrooms are widely eaten in Japan. Let's look at some of the more famous ones. The matsutake is the gold standard of edible mushrooms. The Japanese love its distinctive aroma and flavor. Matsutake cannot be cultivated, and the amount harvested from the wild is small. This means very high prices. Many people simply can't afford them. The matsutake grows only in forests of Japanese red pine, a dry environment with few nutrients. It forms rings around the roots of these pine trees. The matsutake is symbiotic with the Japanese red pine. In exchange for nutrients from the tree's roots, the mushroom supplies the tree with minerals from the soil. This unique ecology is hard to replicate artificially. Since the flavor of the matsutake declines once its cap has opened, it's collected when it's poking just two or three centimeters out of the ground. This is a quintessential matsutake dish steamed in a clay teapot. Its pleasant aroma is irresistible. Grilled matsutake has a crisp texture. You'd be hard pressed to find a Japanese person who didn't enjoy eating matsutake in the autumn. Here we have shiitake. This firm and fleshy mushroom is the most frequently eaten type in Japan. Shiitake grows on withered broadleaf trees, such as sawtooth oak and Japanese chinkapi. Techniques for growing shiitake are well established, and these days most of the shiitake that people eat are cultivated. These are plugs of shiitake spores. Shiitake are cultivated by embedding spore plugs into meter-long logs, which in this case are sawtooth oak. Two years later, the spores have spread all over the logs. The logs are flipped over and hammered. This stimulates the wood and causes the shiitake to fruit. The mushrooms absorb nutrients from the log, forming full-bodied shiitake in around two weeks. They are best eaten before the cap has fully opened and the edge of the cap is still rolled inward. 
That's when the gills are packed with shiitake spores and the flavor is richest. Shiitake can be sauteed or boiled. It's a versatile mushroom that goes well with almost any kind of cuisine. Dry shiitake has a stronger aroma and more nutrients. It's also non-perishable and has long been widely used as such. Some mushrooms have medicinal uses. This is an unusual kind of mushroom called caterpillar fungus. It grows on moths, cicadas, bees and other insects. It has long been used in traditional medicine as a nutritional supplement. And down here, we have the Ling Chi mushroom, which grows at the base of broadleaf trees. The caps are fan-shaped, 10 to 15 centimeters across. They grow over a period of many years and are thus considered an auspicious symbol of a long, healthy life. Ling Chi is very hard and has a gloss almost like lacquered wood. Because of these traits, Ling Chi is used not just medicinally, but also decoratively including in the display alcoves of traditional Japanese rooms. Hachijojima is an island about 300 kilometers south of Tokyo. Here, amid forests of fan palm, grow some strange and wonderful mushrooms. Mycena chlorophos is one. It grows in clusters on fallen trees from early summer through autumn. It seems like a small ordinary mushroom until you see it at night when its cap and gills glow in the dark. Just five or six of these mushrooms provide enough light to read the small print of a newspaper. Mycena chlorophos glows for only three days. Now, another type of glowing mushroom. These tiny mushrooms, just two or three millimeters in size, grow on fallen leaves. In the dark, they become countless dots of light, each dot a mushroom, peeking out from the pleats in the leaves. There are about 40 known species of bioluminescent mushroom in the world, and seven of them grow on Hachijojima. But exactly what makes these mushrooms glow remains a mystery. These days, glowing mushrooms are one of Hachijojima's top tourist attractions. If I told you that this forest was still part of the city of Weda, I wonder if you'd believe me. I'm told there are about 30 different types of edible mushrooms to be found here. Of course, we're going to have a look. And luckily, I have a guide today, Mr. Yoshiji Nishimaki, who's a specialist in this kind of thing. So, Nishimaki-san, thank you for being with us. And where should we be looking for mushrooms? Well, along paths like this, where there's not a lot of fallen leaves. Well, that was quick. I like that. These ones are poisonous, so you can't eat them. You also find mushrooms on rotting trees, like that. OK, so we'll, shall we start? Yes, let's go. And what about these ones here? These are edible. They're called foliota lenta. What's the correct way to do it? You hold the stem and gently pull it out. These things at the bottom are called hyphae, and you take them off and put them in the ground so that more mushrooms will sprout next year. A little collection of these to start with. There we go. Oh, this is pretty. What about this? That one's poisonous. It's called fly agaric. Mushrooms that are red and kind of nice looking, well, they tend to be poisonous. What about this one? 
Oh, that's a good one. It's a variety of Fusen Take. It's found in high altitude woodlands where the air is fresh. It's a tasty mushroom. Nice one. Okay. Oh, there's another one over here. Oh, and another one. And another one. And another one. And another one. Oh, they're all over the place. Well, we've been walking around for about half an hour now, and look at what we've got. It's quite a nice little collection. I hope these taste as good as they look. Anyway, let's move on now and take a look at the history of mushrooms and the Japanese way of life. The link between Japanese people and mushrooms stretches back to prehistoric times. This is an archaeological site in Akita dating back 4,000 years. Eighteen years ago, mushroom-shaped clay sculptures were found at the site. They believed to have been an offering to the gods, a prayer for good mushroom harvests. Since the 8th century, mushrooms have been prized as an autumn delicacy. Japan's oldest poetry collection makes reference to mushrooms. The poet praises the wonderfully fragrant aroma emanating from a multitude of matsutake. Picking matsutake was one of the great pleasures of autumn for Japanese aristocrats, and they express that pleasure in their poetry. In around the 13th century, Vegetarian cuisine spread through Japan along with Zen Buddhism. At the stricter Buddhist temples, which forbade the eating of meat or fish, mushrooms became an essential ingredient. Shiitake in particular, which could be eaten by itself or used to make broth, was very important. Mushrooms began to be consumed by the population at large beginning in the 17th century. It was a time of peace and culinary culture flourished. This cookbook from the late 17th century records nine types of edible mushrooms, including matsutake, shiitake and oyster mushrooms. At around this time, the cultivation of shiitake began and production boomed. Merchants appeared who would peddle forest-gathered mushrooms to city dwellers. More and more kinds of mushrooms were being eaten. Mushrooms even became material for kyoge, a traditional performing art that makes people laugh with exaggerated actions and dialogue. The name of the piece you see here simply means mushrooms. A home is played by a sudden outbreak of mushrooms. No matter how often they're picked, they sprout again. Finally, a proud mountain priest is called in to exorcise them. But the mushrooms continue to multiply and ultimately get the better of the snooty cleric. The priest is a symbol of the powerful and the resilient mushrooms are a symbol of the common folk. The play is a satire that reflects how everyday people in the old days felt about figures of authority. Then, as now, mushrooms were the people's choice. This is a restaurant that specializes in mushroom cuisine, and as you can see, I've got quite a feast here in front of me. And I'm joined by Kyoko Sato, who's the chef here. This is mushroom soup. Eight kinds of locally gathered mushroom are simmered in miso. It's a local speciality. These are matsutake dishes, steamed in a clay teapot, grilled, cooked with rice, and this is sashimi. Sashimi, that's the first time I've ever seen that. Now we've got some soy sauce and wasabi here, which is what you'd have with regular sashimi. Mmm, my god. And you have that distinctive aroma, which blends very interestingly with the soy sauce and the wasabi, that's a really good blend. In Japan, people say matsutake for fragrance, shimeji for flavor. So many matsutake recipes accentuate its aroma. For shimeji, there are many recipes that draw out its flavor. This is tempura, and dressed with mustard. 
The mustard brings out the shimeji flavor. Mm. Shimeji have a very light, delicate taste. It blends with this mustard in a really interesting way. Now, I've never had that before, but that is something if I see it on a menu again, I will go for it, definitely. Now, shimeji is something that we have at home quite often. Mm. Matsutake, not so, because they're just far, far too expensive. Even here, matsutake are expensive. So mixing them with rice is the most common way to enjoy them. Mm. Well, that's not altogether surprising, because 50 years ago, the amount of matsutake harvested in Japan every year was about 5,000 tons. Now, that's down now to about 100 tons, or 2% of what it used to be a half a century ago. And people are now trying to find some kind of way to reinvigorate that harvest. This is Iwaizumi, a town in Iwate set amid the Kitakami Mountains. It's home to a 20,000 hectare red pine forest, one of Japan's largest. In the past, large amounts of Matsutake were gathered here. We used to get so many matsutake that we get tired of eating them. However, beginning in the mid-1960s, Iwaizumi saw a dramatic fall in matsutake harvests. Forestry, the primary local industry, also declined, and the community fell on hard times. So 23 years ago, Iwaizumi launched a town revival plan that centered on matsutake a special research facility devoted to revitalizing the Matsutake harvest was established. Fumihiko Yoshimura, a prominent Matsutake researcher from Kyoto University, was enlisted to head the research facility. We wanted to have so many Matsutake sprouting in Iwaizumi that you'd find it hard to avoid stepping on one. That was what we had in mind. What caused the steep decline in Matsutake in the first place? Yoshimura focused on the increasingly neglected pine forest. It had become overgrown with broadleaf trees. Look at that scrawny red pine. It's no wonder the red pines aren't growing well anymore. The broadleaf trees muscle their way in and the red pines wither. See the broadleaf trees? In the old days, a broadleaf tree this big would have been cut down and turned into charcoal. Iwaizumi once had a thriving charcoal industry. Fallen branches and trunks would be gathered as firewood and their leaf litter used as kindling. But as Japan's post-war economy took off, a new modern lifestyle emerged, one that had no need for local timber or fallen leaves. The pine forest went untended, and broadleaf trees quickly took over. The red pines, which Matsutake need for a supply of nutrients, lost their former vitality. In a pine forest overgrown with broadleaf trees, all the fallen leaves form thick mats of leaf mold. As a result, the soil is packed with a nutrient surplus, and that spurs the growth of molds and bacteria which are the natural enemies of Matsutake. The environment becomes more and more hostile to Matsutake growth. Matsutake needed not just the red pine to survive, but also human intervention. Yoshimura explained to the people of Iwaizumi that they would have to cut down the broadleaf trees and rake up leaf mold from the forest floor just as they used to. The locals were skeptical at first, but they got down to work on the forest. And before long, they were seeing results. In 2003, Iwaizumi's Matsutake harvest reached six tons, three times greater than it had been just 14 years before. And the quality of the mushrooms was excellent, on a par with Kyoto's finest. One autumn day, the townspeople assemble with freshly gathered matsutake for a banquet in honor of Yoshimura. I would like to propose a toast of thanks. All together now, cheers. They enjoy a feast of local matsutake dishes, 
the fruit of Yoshimura's and the community's efforts. This is it, the one and only Iwaizumi Matsutake. Building on his success in Iwaizumi, Yoshimura is now working to revive Matsutake harvest in other parts of Japan. As you've just seen, the matsutake is a kind of mushroom that cannot be cultivated, but Japan does have about 30 different kinds of mushroom that are cultivated. And I'm actually now at a mushroom farm. At this place, they raise a number of different mushrooms, including nameko and shimeji. And I'm joined now by Atsuko Miyazawa, who's one of the growers here. Now, what goes on in this room? In this room, we germinate the mushroom spores. What we do is we put a mixture of sawdust and rice bran into bottles, and then we put the spores into them. So this white stuff we can see at the top here, is that, that, is that what that is? They get bigger and bigger and fill up the bottles. And then we give them water and a stimulus. It's considerably cooler in this room and we've got steam all over the place now. This is the room where we grow the mushrooms. It's 15 degrees and the humidity is about 95%. And these are shimeji. And over here we've got, so I've never even seen any like this before. They're, they're rather beautiful actually. These are called hanatake, a kind of shimeji. They're a bit similar to the king trumpet mushroom. The humidity in this room is even higher than the last one. What's going on here? We're growing Nameko. The humidity is almost 100%. Whoa, it feels like it. Large, medium, small and extra small. We have to sort Nameko by size when we ship them, so it's a laborious process. Cut the big ones first. Wow, that is labor intensive. Well, it's because people are putting this much work into growing these things that we have the ability to eat mushrooms all year round. Let's take a look now at some of the newest developments in mushroom growing. In autumn and winter, oyster mushrooms are a must in stews. The oyster mushrooms in this stew were grown in something surprising. Bean sprout husks. This bean sprout producer in Fukushima is also growing oyster mushrooms. Why did the food company begin growing oyster mushrooms? Bean sprouts are popular with consumers because they're inexpensive, unaffected by weather, and you can grow them all year round. But the beans they are grown from started to rise in price, and that made the business untenable. The boom in bean sprouts was driven by the low price. Unless you can supply them at a low price, there's no business. To avoid increasing the price of the bean sprouts, the company decided to start a side business. They settled on oyster mushrooms, which are grown in the same conditions as bean sprouts. The company uses the bean husks left over from harvesting bean sprouts. The husks are rich in nutrients, so they help the oyster mushrooms to grow, and they make low-cost production possible. For two years, the company researched the relationship between bean husk quantity and mushroom growth. The result was successful commercialization of the mushrooms. Oyster mushrooms raised on bean sprout husks are fleshy and have a rich flavor. They have a great reputation. Meanwhile, the town of Sasaguri in Fukuoka is home to a research center that belongs to the Kyushu University Faculty of Agriculture. Shoji Oga is a professor at Kyushu University. He studies the effects of lightning on mushrooms. Various legends from around the world prompted his research. Here in Japan, in Peru, in South America, in Mongolia. All these places have legends that mushrooms sprout after lightning storms. So I had always been interested in what the relationship between lightning and mushrooms was. A growth medium of sawdust and rice bran is widely used in mushroom cultivation. This medium is used to grow the filaments called hyphae, from which mushrooms sprout. 
Once the high fee have grown sufficiently, Olga inserts electrodes and applies a momentary high voltage shock. This creates an artificial lightning strike felt by the hyphae of the mushroom. He conducted the experiment for varying voltages and stages of hyphae growth. He found that when a shock of 30,000 volts was applied to beech mushroom hyphae, the number of mushrooms increased by 20%. He experimented on more than 10 kinds of mushrooms in total and found that the number of shiitake more than doubled. He also noted that the mushrooms themselves grew larger. When 120,000 volts was applied to king trumpet mushrooms, their mass increased an average of 50%. Some almost doubled in mass. What exactly causes the mushrooms to grow more? Analysis of the hyphae revealed an increased amount of an enzyme called lacase in the electrically stimulated mushrooms. Olga suspected that this enzyme must play an important role in how mushrooms fruit from their hyphae. Electrical shock is a powerful tool, and I want a deeper understanding of what happens when mushrooms fruit. In 2006, Olga and his colleagues developed a special device. It allows them to apply 30,000 volt shocks out in the wild, not just in the laboratory. Using this device, Olga and his team are experimenting on increasing wild mushroom yields. Well, here's the collection of mushrooms that I gathered in the woods earlier on. As you can see, there are lots of different types to be found. And with human help, we knock on logs to wake them up and we give them electric shock therapy and do all sorts of things. God knows what they think of us, but we certainly enjoy them. I'll see you again next time. Next time, vending machines. Japan's amazing vending machines are the product of the country's technological prowess and also social demands. We'll look at their history and their latest cutting-edge features.